Fourth Sunday of Advent, Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David, his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. On the first, second, and third day of Advent, the candles of love, hope, and joy were lit, symbolizing proclamation, expectation, and joy. Today, on the fourth Sunday of Advent, we light the third blue candle as a symbol of purity. It is a candle of peace. May the purity of the Holy Spirit make us ready for the coming of Jesus, our hope and joy. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we continue our journey to that holy day that we classify as Christmas, the Advent season as we are preparing one Sunday at a time. Thank you already for the beautiful opening worship, for the lighting of our Advent candle, and may your blessings be upon us in this hour together, and may all of God's children say. It comes from Matthew 1, 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, John.
Good morning. Well, I am going to start with the scriptural Psalmonex part of Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy. Uh, you probably say, the first 17 verses, I'm glad we skipped over that because that's the scriptural Psalmonex part. We jumped into the verse 18 and got to the really exciting part. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the genealogy because let me assure you, genealogies, even though they might seem like Psalmonex put you to sleep type passages, they really have exciting stuff contained in them, and I don't even have time to talk about all of it. But I want to touch on a little bit of it. Verse 1, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You see, Matthew was writing to Jews, and a Jew is going to say, hey, you're telling us about the Messiah? Well, first of all, he has to be a son of Abraham, and he has to be a son of David. And yes, Matthew says, by golly, he is. Jesus was the son of Abraham, and he was the son of David. Okay, well, why does he have to be a son of David? Because he has to establish an everlasting kingdom over all the nations of the earth. And he has to be a son of Abraham because Abraham was promised that through his descendants, one of his seed would bless all the families of the earth. Wow. Now, you see... He starts off this way because the end of the book, because people would say, well, you know, Jesus, yeah, he was a descendant, but all these other guys were descendants too, and they weren't the Messiah. So that's why Matthew comes to the end of his book, and he ties it all together. He says, Jesus is the one who said, all authority in heaven and in earth have been given to me. He is the everlasting king because he's resurrected. He's never going to die. He's going to establish an eternal kingdom. And he said something that no conqueror ever said. He, Alexander the Great couldn't say this. Hitler couldn't say this. Genghis Khan couldn't say this. He says, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. He is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. And then what does he say to his disciples? He says, go to all the nations and disciple the nations. That's the promise to Abraham, that he would bless all the families of the earth, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles as well. So Matthew beautifully ties together this entire book from the beginning to the ending. And he points us to Jesus as the true Messiah. You should be excited. This is really neat stuff, isn't it? Yes, but there is a problem with this genealogy. Because in verse 11, it talks about a guy by the name of Jeconiah. Another name they had was Jehoiachin. He was one of the kings of the line of David. And he was a wicked king. He was the last of the line of David. And he actually brought about the destruction of the nation of Judah. And so God, in Jeremiah 22:30 curses Jehoiachin or Jeconiah. And he says, no Son, no descendant of you will ever sit on the throne of Israel. Wow, we have a serious problem here because the Messiah has to claim the throne through the line of the kings and Jehoiachin or Jeconiah has a curse on his line, his descendants. Well, how is this going to be overcome by God? Because Joseph, you see, was the physical descendant of Jehoiakim, or Jeconiah. And so Jesus is the adopted son of Joseph. He has all the rights of a full-born, full-blooded son. He can receive the throne legally through his father, Joseph. But he wasn't born as a physical descendant of Jehoiachin or Jeconiah. So he escapes that little problem. That's why in the book of Luke, we have another genealogy given to us. And it connects Joseph to his father-in-law, the father of Mary, because, you see, Jesus physically was born through the line of Mary. So he is a descendant of David, and he is a descendant of Abraham. You see how God fit all this stuff together from hundreds and hundreds of years in an amazing fashion, in an exciting fashion, because this really is God's book. God wrote this book. He put it all together in an amazing way. And in the genealogy of Luke, he traces this, the line of Jesus all the way back 
to, Ab to Adam, the very first man. And why is that? What was the promise to Adam? That through one of the descendants of Adam and Eve, a child would be born. And there he's called the seed of the woman. That's significant because everywhere else in Scripture it talks about the seed of the husband, the seed of the man, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, the seed of Jacob. But God doesn't mince words. He says what he intends to say. The seed of the woman because Jesus is not going to have a human father. His father is the Holy Spirit. So he will be born the seed of a woman, but not the seed of a man. That leads us to this beautiful passage, if you'll throw it up on the board for me, please, Rochelle. So, we jump into the birth of Jesus, and we have to talk a little bit about the uh, marriage customs of biblical times, because they're a little bit different than ours. In biblical times, when people got engaged, they couldn't back out of the engagement. Now, you can literally stand at the altar and say, in our customs, in our culture, you can stand at the altar and say, hmm. I don't think this is good for me. I'm going to back out. Now, that would be kind of crazy, but, you know, you can do that. You can back out of engagements. But in biblical culture, they signed a contract. So legally, you were married at that point. You were husband and wife. You just didn't come together. And there was several months of preparation where you were getting ready to be married. Sometimes up to a year, they would wait. And then they would come together, and they would actually live together at that point. So they're in this engagement period where they're actually husband and wife, but they haven't come together yet, and they haven't had sexual relations. And you shouldn't have sexual relations when you're not yet come together and you're fully married. So that's considered fornication, by the way, folks. And if you committed fornication with your spouse or with your girlfriend or boyfriend, you need to ask God forgiveness and you need to ask them forgiveness. But Joseph has a bit of a problem here because he's married to Mary, but they haven't come together yet. All of a sudden, he finds out she's pregnant. And what's the logical conclusion he's going to draw? Um, she committed adultery. I've got a serious problem on my hand. What do I do with this? Well, it tells us he's a righteous man, but the passage indicates that he still wanted to marry Mary. He loved her. He was afraid to take her, though, because, hey, if she committed adultery before marriage, what's she going to do after marriage? He's quite concerned about this. And, you know, in the Old Testament law, you actually, one of the penalties of death was committing adultery. And that, this passage shows us that that was, a, that was a absolute penalty. It wasn't a necessary penalty to be enforced. You didn't have to be put to death. You could give a ransom. And escape. Many of the death penalties in the Old Testament, you could escape if you gave a ransom. The only one that you couldn't escape from is if you committed premeditated murder. That was one thing the Bible says you cannot give a ransom for that. It does require capital punishment. So Joseph, being a righteous man, he figures, well, I don't want to, he, you know, this is an amazing story. Joseph was quite a guy. He says, I don't want to expose her to public disgrace. I don't want to take her into court and embarrass her. You know, I'm just going to quietly divorce her. Just put her away. That's what I'm going to have to do. Well, that had a little problem for Mr. Joseph because then he would forfeit the dowry. He hadn't proved he would be the one that would look to be the one that violated the marriage covenant. He would forfeit the dowry. But he loved Mary enough that he wasn't going to expose her to public disgrace. He was going to divorce her. But as, if you'll put the next part up, as he considered this, and he was thinking about what he was going to do, an angel of the Lord came to him and appeared to him in a dream and said, David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is conceived by the Holy Spirit. This is the supernaturally born child. And you know, all through the Old Testament, many, many people were supernaturally born. You remember the story of Abraham and Sarah? They couldn't have children. And they got up to 99 years and 89 years of age, and it's like, we're not going to have kids. I guess, you know, I'm just going to, Abraham figures, I'm just going to have to adopt somebody as my son. You know, I know God says we're going to have kids, but it's not going to happen. God says, no, it's going to happen. You're going to have a child of 100, and, you're Mary, and, Mary, and Sarah's going to be 90. 
What? Half children, 90 and 100? You've got to be kidding me. Well, God can do it. Is anything impossible to God? No, it's not impossible to God. But this even surpasses that because this is a virgin. You can't have a child with a virgin. Yes, you can. The Holy Spirit can conceive the child. And this is a fascinating passage because, um, you know, the Catholic Church tries to solve the problem of what do you do with a sinless, or a sinful, I should say, mother bearing a sinless child. And so they came up with a doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, meaning that Mary was born as well sinless. Now, that's not a scriptural doctrine. In fact, in the Magnificat, in Luke chapter 1, Mary refers to God as my Savior. So Mary is a sinner. And this has led many theologians, and I think it's rightly so, that the sin of the child, the sinful nature of the child, comes through the father, not through the mother. And you can't prove that, but it's, it's probable, it's very likely. And so this is an exciting thing. And Joseph's told, hey, you need to take Mary as your wife. She hasn't cheated on you. She has a child that is going to be supernaturally born through the Holy Spirit. And this is a very special child. This is where verse 21, which we have on the board, is so important. She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now, the Bible in the New Testament was written in Greek, and the word Jesus is pronounced Jesus. But that was the Greek name for the Hebrew name Yeshua. Actually, Yehoshua would be Hebrew and Aramaic, which they spoke in Jesus' day, would be Yeshua. And that's another word that we translate, or transliterate, I should say, as Joshua. Now, many, many babies in Israel were named Joshua. Because Why? Because Joshua was one of the great figures of Israel's history. He was a hero of Israel's history. So many children were named Joshua. It was a common name. Jesus was a common name. Many Spanish people named their sons Jesus, Jesus. It's a common name. Well, what was the meaning of that name? It meant the Lord saves. And so when they named their children Yeshua or Joshua, they were saying, they were confessing, I believe the Lord is, is the Savior. And that's exactly what the Old Testament said. There were many saviors throughout Israel's history. God sent many deliverers, many saviors. In fact, at the men's group this week, I talked about Othniel. Othniel was one of the judges. He was the first judge of Israel, and he's called a deliverer or a savior in the book of Judges. The book of Nehemiah talks about God sending many deliverers, many saviors throughout the history of Israel. So, but Isaiah 43, verse 11 says, there is no savior apart from me. That is God. So all these earthly saviors that he raised up were pictures or types. They pointed forward to the ultimate savior that was going to come. And that's where this verse is so significant. Because remember, these other families named their children Joshua or Yeshua, Jesus, because they were confessing God is going to save us. But what does it say about this child? Name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus is just a creature. He's not God. Well, this verse is one of the passages that you can take them to because it's not. It doesn't say he will save God's people from their sins. It says he will save his people from their sins. That is because Jesus is God, and he will save God's people because he is God. And he comes to save his people from their sins. And then Isaiah quotes, or he quote, I should say, Matthew quotes from Isaiah, if you put up the next section here. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
I wish I had time to go through the history of that prophecy. It's an incredible prophecy, an incredible prophecy. Just briefly, Ahaz was the king of Judah at that time. I'm just going to touch on this. Ahaz was the king of Judah at that time, and he was facing the threat of two nations to the north that were going to come down and destroy him if he didn't join an alliance with them. And Isaiah comes to him and says, no, that's not going to happen. They're not going to kill you, and they're not going to wipe out your family. Why is that? Because Ahaz was in the line of David. If he gets killed and his family gets wiped out, there is no Joseph. So even though he was an unbelieving king, he didn't trust in the God of Israel, Isaiah tells him, don't worry about these kings of the north that are threatening to you and threatening to overthrow you and put somebody else on your throne. It's not going to happen. Well, Ahaz doesn't believe in the God of Israel, so he has another plan. He says, no, 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 no. I've already taken care of these two kings to the north. I've contacted the king of Assyria, and he's going to come, and he's going to beat those guys up for me, and I've already you know, given him a whole pile of money to do this. Well, stupid thing to do, um, because the king of Assyria already planned to beat up these other two guys. You need to give them your lunch money. And I just use an illustration. It's like a sixth grader saying, hey, senior, I want you to come beat up those seventh graders that are threatening me. You don't need to give your lunch money to the senior. He's already going to beat up the seventh graders anyway. So Isaiah says, I know you're scared, Ahaz. I know you're terrified. Ask for any sign in heaven or in earth, and God will show you that he's going to take care of you. you know, if he had half a brain, he would have said, well, Send fire down from heaven and destroy their armies and destroy the, the, the 12th graders' armies too. Just wipe them all out. You know, that would have been the smart thing to do. He said, no, 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 no. I've already got my plan and it's already in place. And you know, my 12th grader is going to take care of the 7th grader, so I have no problem. And uh, so Isaiah says, okay, God's going to give you a sign. A virgin's going to conceive and give birth to a son. Well, I'm sure Ahaz said, a virgin, that doesn't do me any good. I don't need a baby. I need armies. I need armies. That's what's going to protect me is some big army. And they've already defeated my army, so I don't have an army. I'm in trouble. Uh, No, you're not. Because guess what? You have to stay alive because this son is going to be born. And he's going to be in your kingly line. And he's going to rule. You're protected because of this future baby that's going to come. You don't see the big picture. You see this little narrow problem that you have, and you have to figure it out on your own. You think, no, 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 no. It's already taken care of. God's taking care of it for you. He's protecting you, Mr. Ahaz. Wow. And this child that's going to come, he's Emmanuel. He's God with us. You see, God had this all figured out before you ever came on the scene, Mr. Ahaz. God had his plan. He worked it out through hundreds and hundreds of years before you ever came around. He had everything all figured out, all worked out, because it's his story. That's what history is, his story. Wow, this is amazing. Last verses, please. So when Joseph woke up, it says, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded. He took Mary home as his wife. He took her to be his wife. Next section, please. But, this is significant. Notice, he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. Now, why is that important? Because the Bible tells us that a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. So it has to be a virgin conception and a virgin birth. So they don't, they come together, but they don't come together physically until the child is born. You see, Matthew puts in every important detail that he has to put in there. And he did just exactly what the angel said. He gave him the name Jesus. When I read this passage It blows my socks off. This is such exciting stuff. When I look at the scriptures, I'm like, wow, this is the word of God. It is not humanly, it's not human composition. 
A lot of people say, oh, that's just the word of man. A bunch of people put this Bible together, you know. It's, it's not God's word. It is God's word written over centuries of time, beautifully woven together tapestry that tells us God wrote this book. This is his promised Messiah. You need to believe it. You need to look to him who was called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Right away, you should raise your hand and say, I want to be part of that program. I want to be one of his people. I want to be saved from my sins and live forever. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the marvelous truth of your word that points us to the one who is the way and the truth and the life. And may we find our life and our peace in him, our precious Jesus, the one who came to save his people from their sins. Amen. Amen.